everybody. I'm Evie Roberts, and this is my podcast, Talking in the Dark. Welcome. The aim of this podcast is to raise awareness about blindness, visual impairment, and disability in general, in a happy and light-hearted way. For those of you that don't know, I am blind. I was born with a condition called bilateral anophthalmia. Try spelling that one. It basically means that when I was born, my eyes didn't develop properly. So I wear prosthetics instead. The goal of this podcast is to remove some of the stigma and stereotypes around disabilities, whilst also having fun at the same time. Each week, I will be interviewing people from all walks of life including some with hidden or physical disabilities like mine, and getting to know a little bit more about them and the lives they lead. This week, I am very excited to tell you that I will be talking to founder of the Visible People Talent Agency, Louise Dyson, MBE. My name is Evie Roberts, and this is my podcast, Talking in the Dark. Welcome. Louise, how are you? Hi, I'm absolutely great, thank you. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. Um, how's your day going so far? It's going really well. I spent my early morning out gathering flowers and wild garlic before I started work, so that's a really good start to the day. Oh, that's nice. Is that something you kind of do often? Do you like gardening and things like that? Um, I like the gathering of the flowers <laughs> and I love the eating of the wild garlic. Um, I don't really have time to spend, you know, to sort of do very much in the garden. I I did, but uh, but I love being outside. I find that I spend all of my life to computer screens and um, I spend a lot of time looking at contracts and other stuff that I do find completely dull, I must be honest, and it does take up a big proportion of my day. It's a great antidote just to be able to step outside in nature and have the, the birds and the bees buzzing past me, which is wonderful. Well, the bees buzz and the birds sing. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that is really important. I think that, um, like you've said, that being outside and just being in nature and experiencing that, I think that's really relaxing. And I think that it's also really important to find sort of coping mechanisms that can get you away from that computer screen. Yeah, absolutely. You've you've hit the nail on the head there. That's exactly what it is. It really (laughs) is a good antidote. Yes, absolutely. So I know that you are the founder of the Visible People Agency. So to begin, can you tell me a bit about the agency and what it is that you guys do? Well, um, Visible was the first agency worldwide to um, to really, in fact, we had to create the market for disabled actors and models in main productions. Um, it's our 30th anniversary. We've just passed our 30th anniversary, so we've been doing this for quite a long time. And I must 30 years ago, you quite literally never, ever saw a genuinely disabled actor in a mainstream role. Um, you never saw a disabled model in any kind of mainstream campaign. The only exceptions, perhaps, well, they weren't exceptions exactly, were that you would see models um, in charity appeals which personally I found rather disempowering for people. And the point of Visible is to change the public mindset towards disability by first changing the media mindset. And I really felt that the advertising industry, um, you know, we all knock it in lots of ways because of its power to make us spend money on stuff we don't really need. But actually you can harness that power, the power of influencing people's thinking to really make them see things differently from the perspective of someone with a disability and I I think I think after 30 years we're starting to succeed I hope so yeah definitely I mean it definitely looks like you are um but yeah I think that is really important you you say about sort of changing the public's perception and mindset there um I think that that is really important I think what you guys are doing is phenomenal um so what kind of disabilities is it that you guys represent Everybody, literally everybody. There are no exceptions, there are no restrictions. Obviously, the person um, has to have a 
um, the potential to be able to work as an actor or as a model. So if it's as a model, then it's pretty well all about their looks. And yeah, it is. It's pretty well about the way they look, how photogenic they are. In terms of acting, though, uh, what if he wants to be an actor? Clearly, they, they need to have acting ability. And we help develop people um, from scratch. So we've had a number of cases which have been really exciting where we've had um, teenagers, age maybe 12, 13, joined us while they were obviously still at school, um, wondering if there was any possibility of them being able to act. And obviously they're teenagers with disabilities and chances of that ever happening years ago would have been absolutely nil. I mean, the chances of a career as an actor for the vast majority of people without a disability is approximately nil. So it was especially gratifying that we had um, a few people in lead roles, in main cast roles, on very big productions, hugely successful series on Netflix, films and so on, um, who left school and already had an established career as actors. Um, one thing that makes me feel a bit old is that um, in at least two of those cases, they've now got their own children. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly it was a long time ago, but, um, but yeah, so that's exciting. That's, that's a real, that's a, that's a real development that uh, I think we can be proud of. Gosh, yeah, that's amazing. And I can imagine that the feeling of accomplishment for not only you guys, but also the actors in question would have been incredible. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, the one, you know, the, the one thing that I've always wanted to achieve with Visible, our, our sole objective, um, if you like, is really that, to see someone in um, in an acting role, to see someone on television or in a film, or perhaps as a TV presenter with a disability, is for that to be completely, literally unremarkable. Um, that is the the whole point. Um, so I I really hope very much that we've got lots of children these days for whom disability really is just a characteristic that's you know interesting in the way that all sorts of things are interesting, but. Um, but completely irrelevant to their perception of that person's ability to do anything. Yeah, hopefully. I think as well, um, I know growing up as a as a visually impaired child, I, I think for a lot of people with a disability, it's really comforting to see people who are maybe actors or TV presenters with a disability. I think it makes you just feel like, well, if they can do it, why can't I? It gives you a real sense of sort of comfort and courage. Yeah, absolutely. That really does light up. It's all about um, empowerment on the basis that if you can see it, you can do it to a great extent, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Now, you mentioned earlier that the agency is celebrating its 30th year this year. But like, what initially made you want to establish this type of agency? Golly, well, it is a bit of a story. Um, originally, way back when, um, I used to own a, a model agency, a regular model agency, and it's what I did. It's what I did when I left school. Um, don't ask me why, but when I was eighteen, it seemed like a really good idea, and I was drawn by the creative possibilities of the modelling industry. Um, it turned out to be very different to what I'd imagined in lots of ways. First of all, everybody's perception is that modelling equates to the fashion industry. The reality is that the fashion industry represents something like 2% of all model jobs. 98% are advertising everything from car insurance to hair dryers to, I mean, you name it, just about everything. Um, but one of our clients was... Um, uh, the manufacturer, the biggest manufacturer in the UK of mobility equipment, a company called Sunrise. And we used to provide them with regular models to sit in wheelchairs and obviously promote them for advertising that went in the back of the Sunday Times when they used to have that kind of thing um, and in magazines and so on. And of course, these people did not have genuine disabilities. Nobody had ever suggested the possibility that there would be someone with a disability who could model it was a completely alien concept um, and this particular client Sunrise contacted me and said actually we've had a couple of customers who said they'd love to see genuine wheelchair users modeling our products can you help us find some and we I thought that was a great idea never occurred to me before and we got together and created a competition to find 
people with potential to model, but also people with any disability at all. It wasn't actually restricted to wheelchair users for the simple reason that I could see immediately this was something that the advertising industry really needed. Um, that's where the, the idea, that's where the idea began. And we did have incredible success with the competition. We had over 600 entries and um, and I'm in touch with um, the people who, um, you know, some of the finalists, in, you know, the main winner. So, yeah, it was successful. Well, yes, it definitely sounds like it. But do you think if it wasn't for Sunrise sort of getting in contact with you in that way, do you think you would have ever set up an agency like this for disabled individuals? That's a good question. Do you know, Evie, nobody has ever asked me that before. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really good question. Um, I can't honestly say that I knew because it had literally not occurred to me. As soon as it occurred to me, the thought was, well, yes, it's a given that you require people who are genuine wheelchair users for your, ad for your own advertising. But this is so much better. This is an idea that can really change people's thinking, um, change perceptions about disabled people. So I did immediately see the potential in having some positive influence. Um, but I don't honestly, I, I don't honestly know if it, I wonder what it would have taken for it to occur to me. Yeah, I totally get that. I wonder though, if it was almost, it was like a bit of a fate thing. It was always kind of meant to happen because someone's got to do it. So I, I wonder if you were always kind of a little bit destined to set up something like this. I think the universe definitely put me in the right place at the right time. And I was the person to do it because I'd already run the model agency for so many years, 20 years, um, in fact, 20 years plus. And it was then, by that time, it was the biggest agency outside London. And I covered the whole spectrum of work. As I say, not just fashion, not just editorial work. We covered absolutely everything. So we worked for... Or just about every kind of company, everything from producing fashion shows to sending people to overseas markets, like Japan was the main one, um, and uh, a number of the other sort of capitals, Milan and Paris and so on. Um, but I think that I, I'd really had enough of that industry to a great extent. It's I'd had the opportunity to influence thinking in that respect in some ways, because again, just going back far enough, when I first began that agency, the way women were portrayed in advertising was very, very narrow, to put it mildly. The chances of having anyone who was non-Caucasian in any role at all with any kind of environment was honestly nil. Um, same applied to women, really nil. And so it did give me the opportunity when, when for example, when we had a uh, a shoot, we had a lot of this kind of thing for big hotel groups and they would want to promote their conference facilities. Um, and so they would set up a kind of conference scenario. The only way that you would ever have a woman picture uh, was if she was serving the coffee to the white men um, who were the conference delegates. If you had a face that was not white, it was somebody in a uniform as the bellboy. I mean, it was so bad, Evie, you cannot imagine. It's so bad. Um, and things changed. Happily, things changed. And it did change because of the power of advertising. So seeing people in different scenarios where they were empowered. So we had the opportunity to put forward everybody, everybody of every ethnicity for every role. It wouldn't occur to us not to. And that 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 was quite a useful thing. Um, but it but I'd really done it for a Time. I think 20 odd years is, is enough and it was time to do something perhaps a little bit different. So had I, I think the answer to your original question is not so much would I have thought of, uh, of a specialist agency like Visible because the chances are it may not have occurred to me, um, but I would have done something totally different it's outside the industry, just something, you know, completely different. Right, okay. So you've kind of already mentioned that your main objective is for, you know, people with disabilities, whether it be in acting or modeling or presenting, for that quality to be sort of completely unremarkable. So how are you kind of working towards achieving that within the industry? Uh, well, I think we've achieved it to some extent in that I think now any production that comes on TV, any TV series, any film, 
I don't think someone would notice and think, wow, look at that, if they saw um, if they saw one of the characters was a wheelchair user, for example. I don't think that, is, maybe I'm kidding myself, but I don't think that is literally so remarkable. Whereas at one time, it would have been, it would have been a completely alien concept. Um, to jump onto something which relates to this, and again, part of the really big picture, the single job probably the most proud of having um, handled, perhaps, is when we were able to place one of our fabulous girls as uh, one of the main CBeebies presenters, um, Kerry Burnell. And the great thing about that, Kerry was born with a, a disability, she was missing and all of and of course CB is, is for very young children up to the age of I think about eight um, and all kids would have certainly noticed that she was missing a hand it was unusual um, and maybe they would ask their parents I mean I, you know people actually say this to me I'm not just speculating um, but then it's oh yeah okay and that's the end of and you know everybody just saw that she was a beautiful woman fabulous presenter um, really accomplished clearly able to do absolutely everything everybody else could do and a lot more besides. Um, and her disability was totally irrelevant. So I would then describe that as being unremarkable. The interesting thing perhaps about that scenario was that she, um, we did receive a number of comments. Well, we received altogether, I think the BBC and us, we received about 12 comments from parents who made comments that were really very unhelpful indeed. Um, which really they were implying that this was something that, that was going to make the kids have nightmares and all of this kind of thing. It was just extraordinary. But obviously, you have to feel sorry for those children to have those parents. Um, happily, in, in the ratio was such that for 12 people, perhaps, who wrote in and this, over 10,000 people wrote in and said, wow, this is fantastic. This is just such an idea. And um, and a lot of the people who wrote in were people with a similar disability to Kerry's. Um, and they were able to say, if only this had been a thing when I was old, I would have grown up feeling a lot, a lot better as a lot better as a school child, perhaps, you know, less bullying and so on. Yes, absolutely. I I mean, it, it comes back, doesn't it, to that thing of, um, you know, seeing people with disabilities in mainstream media as a disabled person yourself it is so comforting um and yeah when you look at that ratio 12 to ten thousand, you're doing pretty well there yeah i think so it it did trigger a lot of great things for kerry um and she's now a successful writer of children's books so it's uh it's all very, all positive yeah i mean that's incredible and it's it's brilliant that she, she's done so well and things have sort of really taken off for her um, obviously, you've mentioned that you're sort of achieving your objectives. Do you think that there is still sort of more work to be done to achieve them, you know, properly? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm afraid we still have a long way to go. It's it's mostly about dispelling fear. People who haven't come across any kind of situation where they're working with someone perhaps with a disability, it's the fear is not the fear of the person with a disability. The fear is of... Um, saying something and embarrassing themselves it's it's all kinds of crazy things but um, that that has limited people's willingness perhaps to just expose themselves to a different way of thinking yeah totally I think it is all about just exposure isn't it and getting people used to being around and seeing people with disabilities and just sort of becoming desensitized to that sort of thing well, yes, and it gives me the opportunity to explain that we have a really unusual spelling of the name visible, which in retrospect, if only I'd called the agency viable, spell check wouldn't have told a bit and changed it so many times, which has been very frustrating. However, the reason um, we call it visible um, is it's a hybrid of the two words, um, really, um, visible and able, and visibility is precisely what you're just saying. It's all about ensuring visibility, the high visibility of people in everyday situations, advertising, promoting things, being lead actors, characters in all kinds of productions. 
um, where their disability is totally irrelevant, not part of the storyline, just completely irrelevant. That we have such incredibly talented actors, models, and presenters. Most of our work is acted. By far, the majority of uh, our artists are professional actors. Um, but we we ha we handle all kinds of stuff. We have people who are influencers, all sorts of all sorts of different things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Talking about that then, do you enjoy the fact that as an agency you kind of look after people um, from lots of different walks of life, you know, actors, models, presenters, that sort of thing? Well, sometimes it's the same person. <laughs> sometimes you'll have somebody who, who is an actor, they have the potential to model. And by the way, they also have such an incredible social media following. We've got people with their own TikTok channels and so on. Um, and YouTube channels. And because of that, we're able to um, negotiate contracts for them to become influencers, social media influencers. Um, but the, the work that really is exciting for most people is acting work, I would say. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that. Do, I mean, do you think that the industry is quite sort of slow to sort of embrace change um, in this area? And if so, why do you think that might be? Um, I think it comes to the kind of fear that I was describing. Um, I've given quite a few talks and been on a number of panels to people in the advertising industry and also the um, acting industry, if you like. The first big talk I gave was to the Equity Annual Conference. And the, most of the delegates there were casting directors and, of course, actors as well. Um, and to Spotlight, which you probably know about Spotlight, the industry main directory and for, for casting people in every kind of role for, um, well, for, for absolutely everybody. Um, and it was important to educate the casting industry, among other things, but also the writers and directors to a great extent. It's all about, um, it's, a, it's actually about pushing people out of their comfort zone. Um, one thing which I've often been embroiled in because I tend to be the person they come to to ask for a comment and they know what I'm going to say, um, is when we have a mainstream role in some, sorry, not a mainstream role, uh, the role for a disabled actor, disabled character, say, in a mainstream production, it might be a feature film or a big TV series, usually a feature film in this case, um, and it's being played by an actor who is going to fake that disability, have no disability. And I'm always asked what, what my thoughts are um, and I feel very strongly about this. And um, certainly, first of all, unless a disabled actor is given every opportunity to go for roles that are disability specific, then what hope is there of anybody with a disability having the role that has nothing to do with disability? So it's a foot in the door. That's really, really been very important. But on the other hand, I also have to say that Ideally, um, I feel that every actor should be able to play every role. Now, that would mean that an, a person with disability can, can learn how to and can play a character with that particular disability, whatever it happens to be. But the caveat, and it's a massive caveat, and for some reason nobody ever discusses this during these interviews, um, is that, of course, it works two ways. It does mean that an actor with a disability should always be able who have the chance to play roles that are not disability specific. Obviously, it's got to be something for which they're suitable, but that applies to every actor. Um, if you're going to be casting somebody in, let's say, a bad heist, um, and you've got a getaway driver, they're not going to go for someone vision impaired. They're not going to go for somebody who's aged, I don't know, 75 either. Um, but it does mean that it does mean that there are a whole number of people who could be completely suitable, whether or not they have a disability. But the big problem is that it's getting the casting directors to really see that. They are completely spoiled for choice with a phenomenal number of actors who are competing for every role. Um, sometimes casting directors, I had a conversation with a couple of them um, last year where one of them was saying that she had had um, for a She'd had over 3,000 actors um, who'd submitted through their agents for that one role. 
um, another casting director I spoke to at the time where she was casting a commercial had had 12,000 12, profiles of actors who were sitting for the role. It was a very well-paid commercial. But there's no possibility of anybody really, you know, being seen properly apart from the few that they happen to spot in those particular cases. Um, so because we're talking about roles that are not pretty specific, when you're up against those numbers, the chances for everybody are approximately nil. And it's a bit like winning the lottery. A good thing, though, is that because of all the work we've done about promoting the importance of inclusion and diverse casting as a means to uh, changing public perceptions, because of this, and of course, there is a really enthusiastic movement um, in the Casting Directors Guild, also equity, and they all embrace diversity. Uh, it does, as long as we make it easy for them, which we do, by having fabulous actors who are completely suitable candidate roles, then it means that quite often we will get the special invitation to submit suggestions, which don't get, um, simply because of the fact they're keen to give the opportunity for some diverse casting. So it can work in our favour in that respect. I've still got to be the right person for the role. Yeah, definitely. But that sounds brilliant. Um, so what would you say keeps you motivated to keep, you know, pushing forward? I think that the big thing that really keeps me motivated, perhaps, I mean, golly, I've always been just totally driven from the day that um, that I came up with the idea of visible, just completely driven. So I've never had to stop and consider where any motivation might be. It's a uh, it's a really pressing need and it gets better every week. It really does. I'd say that we are now probably the um, the big growth um, area in the sector, in the, in the sector of acting, really. It's really busy every single day. You don't have time to pause, to stop to consider anything. Right, okay. Do you really enjoy that it's always that busy um is, is that something that you would say helps you or do you sometimes wish you could just slow down and pause a little bit um I haven't had holiday for decades literally and to be honest we all need holidays and it can be high pressure in fact it is high pressure quite a lot of the time because of a number of factors one of them is that we work to extraordinary deadlines you cannot imagine how late people before they book what are really crucial roles i think the worst for commercials they only cast a commercial literally quite often a couple of days beforehand but having to just drop thing and respond at very short notice um is stressful because we have to get it right you know we have to work really hard to make sure that we're putting up the right people um for the right roles and contact People at short notice can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. Um, and contracts, contracts and release forms, they tend to come through quite often the day before the job. Um, I, yesterday, I had five contracts that came in and five contracts. I'm the person who has to check them all. And by the way, I'm busy doing other things as well. Um, <clears throat> but I have to check them all. One of the contracts consisted of three different documents. One of those documents was 27 pages and the 27 pages of legalese, which, you know, is, as I said earlier, not exactly my idea of fun, but um, but more to the point, I have a responsibility to the to the artist to make sure that I've scrutinised it properly, that I've gone through the most important points with the artist so that they understand their obligations and, and, uh, and so on. Um, and it's just a physical impossibility to squeeze it all in sometimes. Last night, we had a call sheet come through for um, an actor who's booked today, and it came through about 10 o'clock last night. And, you know, they don't actually warn you of that. You just have to keep on looking out for things. So we have an awful, I think I must be quite good. I'd probably be quite good if I took up juggling because we've always got, I probably wouldn't actually, my coordination's but we do always have so many things, um, you know, metaphorically in the air at any one time. And that in itself can be stressful. And of course, people also sometimes have um, it happened where we've had people who've had a bit of a meltdown, suddenly had a crisis of confidence the day before their the night before they're due to go on and do something major the next day. 
And it's up to me then to give them the right kind of confidence boosting talk to make sure that um, they know that they can do it and that they're going to feel good about themselves and um, and really turn it around in a way that's positive for everybody. And, uh, and it does work, but it can be really, it can be stressful, I must say it can. One thing that these days though um is i tend to mostly have my weekends off which is lovely if i can have a weekend free, that's that's great well, yeah that's always good it's really important especially if you have a high pressure role like it sounds like you do um it is really important to have those breaks because otherwise you will just sort of crash and burn out at some point and anyone will that's just a human reflex we all have a limit before we just sort of rash but obviously your role sounds sort of incredibly high pressure do you think that having a role like that has helped you cope better under pressure or have you always been really good at that um I think I'm better under pressure really in some ways at least when I say better I suppose I mean I'm more efficient I think it was George Bernard Shaw but I might be wrong who said don't give me more time give me a deadline and it's true we have lots of deadlines but it means you can just work at a completely different pace. Um, I think the biggest difficulty that I probably had in terms of the pressure of work was for 22 years of running Visible. And that was everything from getting it off the ground to being, you know, to handling every role. I had to be the finance person. I had to be the PR person. I had to be the, the person giving the, the talks to people. I had to be the person who obviously helped um, organise photographic sessions for um, the artist's own um, promotional pictures. And I mean, just a hundred other things. Plus, by the way, dealing with bookings and going out, getting the work and doing lots of press interviews. Um, and for the first 22 years, I, I had no assistant at all. Um, so that was, that meant that my default position personally was always work. And I used to work through the night, every night. Um, it would be unusual if I ever went to bed before four in the morning and of course I had to be up next day to on phones early um, and I just have a terrible sleep deficit that built up over all of that time which I've never quite managed to manage to uh, recover unfortunately I suppose that's not going to happen now but these days we have a fantastic worker, um, Meg whom you possibly had some dealings with and she is just brilliant so that makes life a great deal easier for me um, she's super efficient and efficiency is really important in this industry. You have to be highly organized, sensitive to people's needs, but also highly organized and assertive to make sure that you can get the best out of people. Really. Yes, I can imagine. So what would you say then are some of the sort of shared challenges that the disabled community face within the industry? Um. Ooh. I think there is hmm, um, some of the problems we've had in this industry, I suppose, have been very frustrating. We've had problems with daft things that are rather hard to anticipate. Um, something like the lawyers who ones who draw up the contracts for a TV series, they to be the very last people who come in after we've already gone through a very exhaustive casting process, which has involved arranging for cell tapes and for recalls and, you know, the, the whole process of narrowing it down and then the contract is in. And then at the last minute, we had lawyers who suddenly decided that someone would be uninsurable because of their disability, which is total nonsense. Um, but people are frightened to stand up to their laws. In fact, they don't do it. Um, they don't do it. We've had difficulties during the pandemic when work was trickling, well, work stopped completely for six months, which obviously is a challenge, but work then did trickle in um, and we made a pretty good recovery, I think faster than most other areas of the industry, which is great. Um, but the one sticking point we had on two or three occasions that spring to mind was when we had actors with Down syndrome worked on different productions for major TV companies. And at the very last moment, the lawyers decided that because the government had made some pronouncement about people with Down syndrome having a particular vulnerability to COVID, 
that they could not insure them and they would not book them. And the whole thing was called off. Of course, it's complete nonsense. It's a completely individual thing, like disability. It's a total individual thing. Um, and the in the in the case of the actors who'd been booked, um, they were hugely frustrated and disappointed. And in the case of their parents, who were looking after the arrangements for them, um, they were really angry, in fact, with people who were sort of um, you know, complaining to the government. It was completely it was completely incorrect information. Yes, there were lots of people who were vulnerable, ex- vulnerable to COVID, but they were people with and without all kinds of disabilities. And equally, there were people who had no greater vulnerability than anybody else, likewise, with and without disabilities. So it really did put people in, um, in a box in a way that was really unhelpful. Gosh, yeah, I can imagine, like, that must have been so frustrating for everyone involved, really. Um, Now, I would imagine that accessibility is sort of a key factor. In what ways have you seen progress being made in that area? Um, Good news about accessibility. Um, All the time I've been booking people for um, every kind of job, of course, it's always come down to me to educate the client about what was needed. Um, so in that case, I'm just asking them all of the questions about an example, of course, would be um, that scripts, if if someone is vision impaired, scripts need to be provided in as a word, not as a PDF, because screen reader software hates PDFs. Um, equally, we had to have advanced sight of a script much faster than usual. Sometimes it's very last minute um, for some learning disability because they would need longer to be able to really learn the script. Um, in case of physical access, um, uh, of course, accessible catering trucks, accessible loos, accessible makeup areas when um, when on a film. Um, all of the obvious things, they were easily obvious to me, but everybody needed to be reminded about them. But before all of that, even at the casting process, I've had so many incredibly frustrating situations where despite having already had these conversations with people, um, we, I can remember one in particular, we sent someone for, um, they specifically wanted a wheelchair user for a role and um, they were casting other roles as well for a big TV commercial. And they, we had the conversation, they did see them in uh, a casting area, um, a studio where it's possible to make it accessible. I think it was a ramp that we needed to be able to get the person in, which is not ideal. It would be great. They just went for a level access place to begin with. However, but then they decided, they narrow it down. They see a lot of people and they narrow it down for the recall, for the, the sort of list of people they want to see um, uh, for making their final decision. And one of the people they wanted to see was someone from, a, um, I think actually more than one person, um, wheelchair user uh, for that particular role. And they had... Help, they'd, they'd already booked the recall session. And, and of course, as a commercial, as I mentioned, this is always very short notice. In, it's the day before, usually. And they booked the studio for a recall session in a basement with no lift. So clearly, they're disadvantaging people totally. They're disabling people totally and uh, completely unnecessarily because of their total lack of, in that case, empathy, because we'd already explained to them what requirements were going to be. And instead of seeing people somewhere else, which is what we suggested they did, that they found a nearby cafe or whatever, you know, somewhere that was accessible. Um, they just said, oh, no, I'm so sorry. We're just going to have to forget this one then. So it's a waste of everybody's time. But above all, it's it's a real blow to the self-esteem of the person who, who was good enough to be asked back for the recall, but then decided it was determined that they were not suitable, effectively be recalled purely because of their disability. It is frustrating. So there's quite a lot to be done. And the fact that productions now budget to include an access coordinator, I think is is wonderful simply because it's recognition of the fact that there will always be disabled actions. So that's great. That's a huge step forward. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's such a tricky thing because really it shouldn't be something that people have to be reminded of. But unfortunately, It is. And so I suppose it's just about looking on the bright side of things. And, um, you know, when people do coordinate with access coordinators and things like that, it's just about 
accepting that as the positives and just sort of moving step by step towards it being something that doesn't even really have to be thought about. It's just accepted. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. But we never leave anything to chance. You know, we bear in mind having always um, made point of um, politely but firmly spelling out requirements and checking on them. We still get people who just overlook things and they, they just haven't thought. They just haven't engaged brain properly, really. It's very frustrating. Um, but it these days, because we do so many checks at every stage, it, it doesn't really happen so much. So usually it's um, usually access is is OK. Um, in the case of um, using locations in historical places, that can limit people with mobility um, impairments. Um, but having said that, there is a way around everything. It just depends how much they want somebody. And one of the difficulties, as I was saying about one of the difficulties of casting somebody in a massive role in a feature film where that person is not disabled, but the role is, the character is, it means that disabled actors are not going to become box office, which means that they have the they have this sort of uh, the influence, they have the clout to be able to ensure that that places are automatically accessible, that the that the workaround is is thought of, if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. I think, you know, it's like you mentioned, there's usually always a way to make places accessible. Um, and I agree with you. I think it's just about it's almost about problem solving because there's almost always a way. It's just about thinking about how you can adapt and how you can problem solve to make something accessible. It's very rarely impossible. It's just about engaging properly and thinking about the ways around it. It is. I think one of the things that I've noticed is that the people who have, because it all comes to the will on the part of the, the people with the influence, the ones who can influence the budget, and who can make things happen. So the senior bods involved in anything like this. Um, one thing that has had been situations where those people have been super helpful, um, determined to make it work. And in later conversations, I subsequently discovered that they have a child with a disability or a relative with a disability or a partner with a disability. It's really that they have the disability themselves, to be honest. These are people in senior positions, in big production companies, and that's still... That's still a bit behind on that still. Um, but that has made a difference. That has, it means somebody who's got a natural insight already and uh, hopefully a, a compassion towards making things happen. Yes, yeah, I would imagine that that is always very helpful. So what would you say has been your proudest moment to date? Um, I think the proudest moment for me, perhaps, um, would be having the TV presenter on CBeebies, whereby um, Kerry, Kerry's presence and her expertise really influenced not children who were watching her, but of course they then go on to educate their parents. So that has a huge impact on future generations. That does have a that does have a good thing. Um, and of course, the number of children who have school um, with already a, a, quite an established acting career in their belt. So I think I'm probably proudest of that. It's about it's about people understand about the future. It's about it's entirely about younger generations having a really good sense of themselves, having good self-esteem, not feeling at all held back by having a, a disability, which is just not relevant you know, what they want to do. Um, so I'd say that's probably the, that's the greatest impact I would hope to have really, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And I, I will say, um, so I used to watch CBeebies when I was younger and I remember Kerry being a presenter on it. Um, and I didn't know that Kerry had a disability until I was about six or seven, maybe when my mum kind of just mentioned it in passing, because obviously I hadn't noticed um, but I I thought it was brilliant that she, you know, I, I thought it was brilliant to see that even though she had a disability, she was doing incredible things and she was a mainstream presenter. 
Um, and I, I, I really love to see that. So yeah, that, that was brilliant to see. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm really pleased to hear that. And I'm going to ask you a question, if I can, Evie. Tell yeah. me what you do. What's, what are your future plans? Well, um, I love doing the podcast, to be honest. Um, I've not been doing it for too long, but I absolutely love doing it. And so I would love for a career in sort of podcasting or radio or journalism or something like that. That would be my that would be my dream. But I'm just sort of going to go with the flow and see where things take me see what opportunities come out of the podcast and maybe take it from there well I think you have a really good future ahead of you you asked the most fantastic questions you have you really have you've thought of some very insightful things to ask me about. um and that's 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 quite unusual um a lot of people do tend to ask the same questions and you've actually you've got a, a really interesting perspective so yeah, radio 4 here we come we do actually have quite a few. Um, we do have quite a few roles on Radio Four. They tend to be mostly drama, of course. But I would have thought that, um, yeah, I would have thought this could be for you to consider. But who knows? Yes, hopefully. Well, let's kind of keep talking about the future then. What would you say are your like aspirations for the future? Um, it's the natural progression for Visible now because we've covered so many aspects of work possibilities is really expansion into other territories. So from the very first competition 30 years ago, we immediately had a huge amount of interest from overseas television companies. Um, so several, several countries sent TV crews to film interviews with myself and with the winners of the competition. Um, because they were really excited. It was 30 years ago and, and at the time, obviously completely unheard of, uh, a very alien concept. Um, they loved the fact that you have a combination of human interest in the story about individuals um, and also perceived glamour because everybody imagines that modelling and acting is glamorous. It's truly not, but... Um, but um, but it, it did generate a great deal of interest and that sparked a number of different interviews in magazines and newspapers as well all over the world and also people who then applied to join Visible from everywhere you can imagine. Golly, New Zealand. I remember a chap from New Zealand who all that time ago was really keen to come for an interview and I thought, New Zealand, heck. Um, at that stage, there was no possibility. I was doing my best and working really hard to try and get the idea off the ground in this country. There was only me, so I couldn't I couldn't really give anybody any growth that anything was going to happen anytime soon in their particular country. But I did receive quite a number of um, emails from, from people with disabilities in obscure bits of, I don't know, India, all, all over the place, South Africa, all sorts of places. Um, where they were nowhere near any kind of big city. And they said, although I realise it's probably never going to happen for me, and I would have loved to do something like that, um, it's just really exciting and reassuring to know that things are changing. So that's been, I think that's been something that, um, well, that certainly focuses the mind. That makes me realise that it's all, it's all worth doing. And in future, it's about developing, it's about developing a, a visible in other countries, if at all possible. I think that would be great. I have been approached by people who want to do it. And it's it's really just making sure that they have the right approach, that they they do it for the right reasons. It's really important. You know, it's uh, it's very important that it's all about empowerment. So I'm I'm only really interested in people who have a disability themselves and have a and have a, a particular insight into what we're doing what we're doing. It's not a business proposition. Um, business is a, a strange thing, really. Most people go into business to make money. And you really, well, it was five years before we had our first booking. You really don't do that if you, you know, if you want to make money. Um, but but it's far more important. It's it, it's all about achieving the objectives of of, of the mindset. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I wish you the absolute best of luck with continuing to develop Visible. I mean, I'm absolutely sure that it will all go brilliantly. And um, 
Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think that the work that yourself and Visible are doing is incredible and definitely needed. Um, I mean, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and learn all about Visible. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. That's an absolute pleasure, Evie. It's a real delight to meet you and it's an honour to be invited to come on this podcast. Thank you so much. And thank you to my audience for listening and I will see you all next time. <laughs>